are. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. So I am happy we are in our final quarter of, of the program. <laughs> so I am here to introduce you to Bon Teresa. You got it. Day. <laughs> at the, and she is an MPH student at University of Texas Houston Sciences Center School of Public Health, and she is going to be talking to us today about diagnostic value of extracellular vesicle microRNA in SIV infected pigtail macaques. So, let's yeah. see. Right. Do you want the mic? That'll be, that'll be a lot easier. Yeah, but you have to really talk. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Hello, how's everybody doing? Hey. Oh, that was me. How's everybody doing? Yeah. There you go. So, uh, thank you, Dennis. Welcome to the one-on-one uh, introduction. Just want to read my title again. The mm -hmm. massive value of extracellular vesicles. MicroRNA and SIV infected pigtail macae. And I have a little little model for you guys. This is the macae in like a puppet form. I didn't make it, so uh, I kind of stole it from somewhere, so shh. <laughs> <laughs> and I was working with Dr. Kenneth Winner. Uh, he is affiliated with John Hawkins School of Medicine. I don't know. Okay, click. Did it not? Down. Oh, down. Okay. <laughs> Disclaimer, I have nothing to disclose besides I stole something. But other than that, <laughs> so we talked about a lot about HIV, so I'm just giving you guys a really broad overview. So HIV actually claimed more than 35 million lives so far. In 2016, 1 million people died from HIV-related causes globally. Um, as we know, HIV has no cure yet, and HIV affects the CD4 T cells. So once it attacks the T cell, their immune system will go down, which is really bad. And HIV is a type of lenty virus. So a lenty virus is basically a retrovirus that has a very long incubation period, so you won't know if you have HIV or not. And it gives you really uh, bad symptoms. It can lead to AIDS. So I'm going to go on a little bit. So this is a little cute image of HIV. Uh, I mean, it's not cute. But there's little little receptors. Something really special about HIV, this little gold thing is a capsid, and it's just a really special disease. That's why we can't find a cure for it yet. So extracellular vesicles are, I'm gonna say EVs, because this is a long word. So EVs are basically small particles that actually shed from the, from the cell. So it actually goes from the cell and goes like bye-bye to whatever it wants to do. And so EVs contain whatever the original cell has, including RNA. So we can actually use EVs to track the origin of uh, the actual whole cell via the surface markers, or we can, we can also do a liquid biopsy. So the question here is, can we use biofluid EVs to tell us what's happening in the tissue? So this is pretty cool. HIV is actually an extracellular vesicle. Really cool. So if y'all see this picture, this is a little capsid, the little golden thing, and it pops out with the receptors, and it just goes to another cell and infect it. That's the same way as EV does. They just boop, and go out to the cell. So within extracellular vesicles, the main thing I'm going to focus on today, and you saw in the title, is microRNA right here. So a little bit more about microRNA. There are very short, non-coding um, RNA. And there are negative regulators of translation. So for those that know what translation is, it's basically you taking RNA to protein. So they're going to make protein. Um, negative regulator means that once you have enough proteins, microRNA is like, hey, yo, stop. There's too much protein for me. Let, let me do something else, you know? And also, these microRNAs can be transferred within cells. So with microRNA and HIV connection, microRNA actually, different types can actually suppress HIV infection or activate. HIV infection. And actually, the HIV transcripts from its own, HIV has its own RNA uh, sequence and everything, can be processed just like microRNA like, transcripts. So, really cool. So, my research question is since HIV is an EV, can we use the microRNA extracted from the EVs to actually track and monitor HIV disease? So, I actually worked my butt off within two projects. 
bear with me. <laughs> so first topic is touching on optimization. So this is a, a little stretch that I do. So we want to determine if we get samples from the brain, tissue from plasma, so your, your blood right here, and from cerebral spinal fluid, which is run from your back area. So that's my first project. My second project is experiment 324. You guys remember Stitch, experiment 624, but a little bit similar. So we're gonna see if e <laughs> we're gonna see if EV survived microRNAs review central nervous system diseases and SIV infected markets. SIV is actually the HIV infection for these little guys. So it's called cinnamon um, SIV. And then we wanna see if there's any difference between having a healthy sample and having an SIV infected sample. Okay. So the first uh, project, here's the samples. So again, let me do my stretch from the brain, from the plasma, from the CSL. And we have over 10, we have 10 samples. So I won't go too much into details, but we have brain 10K pellet, EVs, BH means brain homogenous. For plasma, we have two infected macades. So there are actually two different macades. And for CSL, we have CSL EVs and just CSL by itself. Okay, for project 384. So we have 18 infected macades that we actually got sample from. We have 144 that we have plasma sample from, and 144 that have CSL sample from. So within these samples, we have four phases of infection. Pre-infection, which didn't count as a healthy control, is basically no infection whatsoever. Acute infection is when they actually start to have the H uh, SIV infection. So that infection is when we actually administer the anti-retroviral drugs that a lot of people mentioned in the previous presentations. And then rebound. Rebound is when they actually take the, they don't allow the MACs to even, to have the drugs anymore. So this is after they take off the drugs. Okay, so this is a lot of biology, but bear with me. So we first have size inclusion chromatography. So this is based on size. So based on this picture, anything that is really big, so like Mr. Hakeem, Mr. Jonathan, you guys are super big, you guys will go down first. And it is super small, and I am. I'm gonna go down really fast. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So afterwards, I actually have around one mil, one point five milliliter of sample. However, that's actually too dilute. So I have an, I have to use a membrane rocket to concentrate my sample down to around 0.2 milliliters or 200 microliters. After that. Um, for the EVs, we actually extracted all the RNA from the EVs. We were looking for microRNA. And then RT QPCR, which stands for reverse transcriptase quantitative uh, PCR, basically is we have the RNA now, but we want to multiply it. So we're making clones and clones and clones of it until so you have a really good number. That's why we want only 200 microliters of our sample, which is 1.5 uh, milliliters. So that might be much to handle. And the last part, my favorite part, uh, QPCR microarray. So this is actually like when you put your thumbprint and you're like going to jail and put your thumbprint, they would know your profile. This is the same thing. It's a profile uh, uh, analysis where they can tell you what type of microarray you have in the system. So the one I'm using is around, I think we can test over 400 microRNAs in one go, but that's just depending on the machine. Okay. So before I tell you guys a little bit about my results, I'm going to use a measurement called CQ, or quantitation cycle. So CQ is a number, the second number which flourishes is detected in a reaction. So this is basically what happens. So for each cycle of runs, if you if they receive a signal, it will add to the peak. So cycle one adds to the peak and go on. So therefore, there is an <coughs> inverse relationship between CQ and marker ion expression. So if you have a very High CQ number, that means you have a very low microRNA expression or low amounts. You have very low microRNA expression, you're gonna have, uh, sorry, low CQ value, you're gonna have a very high microRNA expression amounts. And no worries, I'll, this is a little example of how it looks like. Okay. Yes, a lot of pretty colors. Ooh, ah! <laughs> so, Based on what I said uh, last time, if you see low CQ amounts, which is boxing uh, black, 
So it shows that brain coma dentist samples actually give us the most microRNA expression, which is really good. However, look at CSL, it's super high, past 40. CSL, actually from this project, uh, told us that CSL is too, the sample is too low of a concentration to give us any good output. So therefore, once I go to project two, we can't use uh, CSL samples just yet for our protocol. But look at all these colors. Ooh. And all these colors represent different microRNAs. That's the nine that we tested so far. So just a little uh, view. Since I told you guys that brain homogeneous actually has the lowest CQ map, just to give you a little graph. So if you notice, there's a big difference from right here to here for almost all the points. But the biggest one we want to see, the biggest one we notice is marker RNA 155. It's actually known to prevent HIV latency, but not too much research has been on it. So I'm going to show you guys a little diagram with this. So only with marker RNA 155, for each sample, plasma, brain, 10K, brain EVs, and brain homogenous, this is actually a big difference. So what I mean by difference is, for example, if it's 22.2 and 22.4, that's not a big difference. The big difference would be 22.4 and 23.4. So if the difference is bigger than one, that means the expression is one-fold or two-fold, depending on how you analyze it. So for some reason, Marco 155 is affecting <coughs> the infected samples in some way. Um, we will soon need to do more research on that. Uh, sadly, for project two, I'm not we're at the stage of QR, QPCR microarray, so I don't have results for you yet. But I'm hoping to see that there's a lot of microarray that says microarray 155 that affects HIV infection. So for project one, just for conclusions, um, we know that Whatever your concentration is, is very important. How much you put in will determine how much you put out. And then again, CSL, um, microRNAs are too low to detect. So we do need to uh, fix the protocols to see if we get more out of CSL. For project two, we still want to see if there can be, uh, EVs can be still a biomarker for HIV infection. And further profile of different sorts of EVs will help make us uh, understand the HIV pathology in multiple ways. So for the direction, higher output from CSF, of course. Um, this has actually been researched that you can get EVs from urine and bile. Pretty cool, you guys saw their uh, article, I can give it to you guys. And also, there has been preliminary research that you can actually use EVs in the same way for ovarian cancer. So hopefully, um, and the article for ovarian cancer is really cool, you want, I can send it to you guys. Hopefully, the, um, we can use it for other cancers, or we can even use it for Zika, measles, and other diseases that my colleagues have presented on. And this is a really interesting question. But we know today we use C4 count to diagnose HIV infection. So is there any correlation between C4 count, viral load, and microRNA expression? And this not too many research has been tested on this, but it would be super cool. We're excited. So this is not everybody, but I want to give a shout out to Dr. Winner, where you see, hi! <laughs> Dr. Huang or Yu Yao, hi. Thank you, Dr. Belcher, the person minds, uh, rise up, John, um, especially the John Hopkins School of Medicine 8 floor retrovirus lab, KKI, Centers for Disease Control, and everybody in this room for even listening to me. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Any questions on our side? Yes, okay. So, so I was wondering, um, you were saying the CSF, it's uh, too low of a concentration. I was wondering if that might have something to do with the blood-brain barrier um, and your concentration of microRNA. Would you, because it's sort of protective, I think? That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> I want to say their blood, uh, blood protection will be probably a big uh, reason why they have low output. And also, CSF itself is very, like a, like a, what someone said, a clean liquid. Right. So it is 
uh, reasonable to not to find anything in the right. PSL. Yeah. But to your question, I will actually research that out and get on about that. <laughs> so, no, so it's just a question because it is, you know, so um, that that's kind of a problem or a challenge that we have when we're treating CSF and things of that nature with cancer therapy, et cetera. So I'm just wondering how that works with the uh, microRNA. And the other thing you had mentioned in your last slide as far as future directions, um, so this possible association or correlation between the microRNA and the CD4 counts. Um, what might be the benefit? Do you think it might be more specific? Why, um, you know, what might that tell us? Would it tell us more in the beginning of your lecture? You talked about the different phases and stages. Would, would it be a little bit more diagnostic about the, the, the disease uh, progression than, than CD4 counts? Or, I mean, because they're... Yeah. So, what I actually look at this, uh, literature on CD4 count and microRNA expression, and apparently, um, even though we have CD4 count, there's actually only a particular uh, species of microRNAs that actually that actually affects CD4, so it will be very specific mm -hmm. to see how it is for the phases. I'll say it more helps um, with CD4. Probably um, Dr. Brenner gave me this example, but what if? <laughs> kind of giving you a shout out. <laughs> so for CD4 count and microRNA expression, we can um, one thing that we really want to look at is the rebound period. So let's first, first say, for example, you are taking the treatment and you're like, okay, I'm going to get out of that treatment based only on CD4 count. Right. MicroRNAs could actually, if this is what we want, can tell us how soon we need to get them off the treatment or how, like, or do we need to delay taking them off the treatment. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say more particularly within the rebound phase, mm -hmm. but I'm pretty sure it can be used within the other phases, but I have not done, um, I have done a lot of research on that, mm -hmm. but I'm more focused on rebound for now. Right, and I was also thinking about kind of this idea of adherence or lack of adherence, mm -hmm. and could that, you know, tell us, um, you know, how long or, yeah. you know, kind of how the person is responding to, to that, mm -hmm. you know? So maybe another marker. Yeah. Any any other questions? Once, once, twice. So <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>